pleasure to introduce uh, four United States Army members of the Special Operations Force. Um, I'm going to give their names. They told me if I said any more about them, they'd shoot me. <laughs> so I'll let them introduce themselves. As they're introducing themselves and talking about their duty stations, uh, think about the questions, because this is going to be a different type of panel. The panel is basically interaction between all of you and them. Not going to be any speeches. and I'm not going to ask any questions. Uh, it, up to you to think about questions you want to ask these gentlemen who are in the uh, special operations. Uh, Major Brennan Goltry, the far right. Uh, Major Ray Ramos. Major Noel Sioson. And Sergeant David Engel. Sergeant Major, I'm sorry, Sergeant Major. So I'll go ahead and get it started. Uh, Brennan Goltry, I'm a California Polytechnical State University San Luis Obispo graduate. Uh, shorten that down, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Um, started my career in the 82nd Airborne Infantry. Uh, signed up as an infantry PL. Did a tour in Iraq, a relatively long one. I think a couple of guys up here have a similar story, 15 months. Uh, after my PL time, uh, came back from Iraq, did my XO time, signed up for the Q course, qualification course, and went through the special forces. After the qualification course, went to first group, so that's PACOM or Indo-PACOM focused. Um, from there, uh, spent some time as a uh, ODA, Operational Detachment Alpha Commander, 12-man team, basically our, our basic unit in the special forces, uh, deployed for about a year into Afghanistan. Uh, after that, came home to first group, did my assistant operations officer time, uh, then my headquarters support company commander time. Then I went to the Navy Postgraduate School, uh, so that's in Monterey, California. Uh, big fan of that place, if you haven't been. Definitely a vacation spot for you and the family. Um, after that, I went out to Okinawa, Japan, and served with the 1st Battalion, 1st Special Forces Group, where I was the executive officer for a battalion in Asia, so we're forward staged uh, in Japan, really where the action is for everything Asia focused. And then I was the uh, Bravo Company Commander. After my time there, they uh, said I was done having fun and shipped me to the Pentagon where I've been for the last 18 months or so. All right. uh, again, I'm Major Ray Ramos. Uh, also a Army Special Forces officer. Um, I uh, graduated from, from West Point, beat Navy. Uh, don't take that personal. Uh, <laughs> that said, um, commissioned as an infantry officer. Uh, I also went to the 82nd, 3rd Brigade, did, uh, did a 15-monther as well. Um, so after that, a couple IEDs came home um, and then uh, tried out and uh, went to the 1st Ranger Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment. Um, spent a couple years there, and then I did uh, some tours into Iraq and Afghanistan with, uh, with the Rangers. Then tried out for uh, Army Special Forces. Um, I spent uh, my ODA team leader time in Afghanistan and also in Latin America doing counter-narco uh, missions there. Um, and then later became the Group Assistant Operations Officer. Um, from there, I uh, went to CGSC. Um, unlike Monterey, California, spent some time in uh, <laughs> Kansas City, which is actually really awesome. Um, not quite the beach, but uh, <laughs> it was fine. Um, and then uh, I was a, uh, a Special Forces Company Commander. Um, again, we did a lot of operations in Latin America. And then I was a Battalion uh, Executive Officer. And now I currently serve on the Joint Staff here for the Deputy Director for Special Operations and Counterterrorism um, for the Chairman. Uh, Noel Siosin, um, West Point grad 2004, so not just beating Navy, but also beating Air Force. Um, <laughs> I branched uh, Armor, um, went to Armor Officer Basic, uh, and was my first unit of assignment was 1st uh, Brigade 25th ID when it used to be at Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, but I never saw a tank again because as soon as I landed in Mosul uh, in 2005, I got pulled into an infantry battalion, and I served as a rifle PL. 
uh, which kind of started my path down to, uh, to SF. So after that deployment, um, the Army moved my brigade from Washington State to Germany. Uh, that was my last conventional Army post. From there, I started uh, the transition, uh, went to um, Georgia, uh, Airborne School, the captain's course, uh, and then North Carolina for the Q course. I was also assigned to first group with Brennan, uh, so I got to return to Fort Lewis and actually live there, but not really because we deployed again. Um, so it was, I was fortunate enough to get a team right away and deployed to Operation Enduring Freedom Philippines, which is not as publicized as uh, the CENTCOM rotations. Um, that was a fantastic mission. Came back from there uh, to basically take leave, and then I did a counter-narcotic training mission back to the Philippines, uh, which was different than the experience I had in the deployment. Returned from uh, that training mission, and then deployed to Afghanistan uh, in Aruzgan, um, which is the mountain uh, area in the middle. Came back from Aruzgan um, with, with my company and my team, and I got pulled up into the battalion staff uh, so that I could help train the battalion to take over as a task force back in Afghanistan. So I returned uh, back to Afghanistan. Following that deployment, I got to go take a vacation in Monterey with Brennan uh, on the beach. Um, and then also assigned to Okinawa, Japan uh, with 1st Battalion. I was able to get two years uh, of command there. And then my third year, <laughs> I was super lucky to get an opportunity to serve um, as a sub-task force commander in the Philippines uh, for Operation Pacific Eagle during the Siege of Marawi. Uh, and then I was also, which is probably the coolest part, um, the principal soft advisor to the ambassador um, throughout you know, the entire country and the span of US Special Operations. Following that, I took an assignment at West Point, which is where I'm at right now. Um, and I'm here chaperoning those misfits on that uh, sixth row. Uh, Sergeant Major. All right, I'm Sergeant Major David Angle. Um, spent the first three years of my career in the infantry, stationed up at Fort Lewis, Washington also. Went through uh, selection and started the qualification course in 2002. Uh, the entire rest of my career has been UCOM focused. Um, I did do an instructor rotation down at Fort Bragg, North Carolina for about three and a half years. I just got to the Pentagon where uh, Major Goldtree and I worked together on behalf of uh, the United States Special Operations Community. Uh, the last eight years prior to the Pentagon, I was uh, stationed in Germany with 1st Battalion, 10th Special Forces Group, holding positions ranging from the senior medic for our battalion up to the battalion S3 sergeant major. I've deployed to pretty much every European country uh, advising our senior leaders there and our, our NATO partners there. And I have some combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I think the main purpose for me being here on this panel, just to kind of set the stage since I'm the only NCO, is kind of to talk about the role and relationship from my lens between the officer and their senior NCO uh, mentor and counterpart. Um, for background, I do have a bachelor's and a master's degree, which is becoming a lot more common in the force and becoming a, an unwritten requirement for us to be promoted to uh, senior NCO positions of E8 and above. Thank you. So. Okay, thank you all for your introductions. Uh, if anybody has some questions, please take the mics. Uh, remember from this morning, uh, when you take the mic with your question, state your name, uh, your school, if you're uh, on active duty, where you're stationed, uh, and if you're a civilian, just say the city you're from. We have some questions. Yes. All right, I'll start. Um, I'm Cadet Weiner from K-State, so Kansas City's not too bad. Um, <laughs> Kansas City's awesome. Uh, especially if you like barbecue. It's um, right, but, you're right. Uh, so my question is, uh, like, to what extent um, have you guys worked with, like, uh, non-military, like, organizations uh, such as, like, the CIA um, and those sort of organizations that also work in the defense sort of realm? Um, and, uh, like, what are, like, lessons you've learned working with, uh, you know, organizations like that outside of the military? I mean, I think we could all take that. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you want to start? 
can keep it keep it simple. Um, <laughs> so interagency experience, team leader uh, in Afghanistan, dealt with the DEA quite a bit, just counter drug stuff, poppy fields being what they are, um, you know, as a source of income for the Taliban. So targeting those. Um, NPS, we had some interagency folks there. Uh, we all have friends that are in the CIA and who have been trained there. Um, yeah, that's probably where I'd leave it at. I'll, uh, I'll focus this, since I currently work here uh, in, in the national capital region, the home of interagency. So that, to, to get after your point, whether it's defense, intelligence, um, whether it's aid and development, uh, even at the most junior level, all of us here have worked with some kind of aid or development organization in the tactical field environment. But here, um, we work with them regularly. Um, and I, I would challenge all of you to this. Um, that culture is really, really important to understand, that sort of intergovernmental uh, cooperation. Um, and I would look at it, and I'm sure you guys would agree, it's sort of like the tribal dynamic that we see, whether it's Afghanistan or Iraq, there's, there's a bunch of governmental tribes, agencies, whether it's the CIA, Department of State, uh, Treasury, USAID, all of those entities have their personalities, just like you all do in this room, whether you're Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, um, you all have your personalities and culture, but at the end of the day, you're all joint, you have to work together. So that's one dynamic, but now you have to do that in the interagency community, um, and building and establishing those relationships are absolutely paramount, and, and that's a, that's a a small little rule you can keep with yourself from the youngest lieutenant uh, or ensign all the way up to wherever you are, you're going to need to find that tribal dynamic and how to operate in and out of it. And I'll, I'll shut up there. Uh, so I'll talk specifically to my experience in the embassy in Manila, uh, where by nature um, we had to work with you know, the organizations that you queried about. I told my group before coming down here I really had two rules you know, for this conference. One was don't be weird, and then two, don't die. Um, I think in support of the relationship aspect that Ray was talking about, um, it's very simple, comparatively speaking, the scenarios we train you on in your respective programs to where you only have to deal with your chain of command and that's it. Uh, it becomes a completely different ball game when the problem set requires a solution uh, which really is only reached with compromise from the various stakeholders that each have equities that likely compete against each other. Um, so for the siege of Marawi, um, it's very obvious what the military wanted to do, uh, what my mission set was, uh, but State Department had also equities with respect to the geopolitical relationship uh, affecting the Philippines and the United States. USAID had its own equities um, because they were, of course, concerned with the internally displaced people. Uh, so trying to manage all of that while working with uh, the intelligence community, because it's not just CIA, um, but working with the entire intelligence community to, to feed the targeting uh, of the bad guys, but also inform um, our, our embassy and our entire mission of what to do, what needed to be done, and more importantly, what decisions had to be made by the ambassador. So, I mean, I think the way I'd address that uh, from my lens is the term whole of government and the approach required. Um, I remember, you know, probably my first combat deployment you start to think that your reason for being there is the most important reason you're there. Everybody else can, you know, that they don't need to be there. I'm the reason, like, <laughs> you know, I'm waving that American flag and I'm bringing freedom everywhere I go. Um, and you start to realize that, you know, we might just track people left and right, but it's not solving anything. Um, you need that whole of government to come in. And I think when you start to think about, you know, from 1776, how long did it take for America to be America, to be, you know, a republic, to stand on its own uh, and, and start to exert, you know, the fortitude to 
repel threats both internal and external. We kind of lose that sight when we start looking at the problem sets we found ourselves globally, and we think there's immediate solutions, and there's not. We use the term building the, the plane already in flight regularly. Um, we don't always have the ability to plan out our exit strategy before we enter into a conflict. And that exit strategy relies on that old government approach. Um, and I think that's, that's probably a really important aspect to remember when we talk about the relationships and everything else, is collectively we have to work towards a, a goal and putting those egos aside and remembering that, you know, no matter how much awesome stuff I think I do, not only just in the military do I have 10 or 15 people supporting me that nobody really ever hears about, but they make, make it possible for me to do my job. It's all the other people that are going to be there to pick up the pieces because we might remove some really bad people, but in doing so, we're also going to disrupt infrastructure and we're going to disrupt family and social dynamics that some other form of our government is going to come in and try to uh, resolve that piece that we've just disrupted. So. Thank you. Uh, next question. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Midshipman Chen from Miami University NROTC. Uh, so there have been some recent uh, articles, reports by Military Times, whoever you may say, uh, that the strain on the special operations community has been uh, increased due to the type of war that we have been engaging in. Uh, from your perspective, how is this, is this true and how has this affected the special operations community? So I think it depends on who you are and what unit you're in. Um, so officers in this in the special operations community, we get a break every couple of years. So you're you're an ODA detachment commander, then you get to go to school. Um, after school, you go back and you do your major time, and you go to the Pentagon, right? So I I'm in and out of uh, deployments, if you will, just being gone from the family. Period. Uh, NCOs don't get the same treatment. Our warrant officers don't get the same treatment. They go to the unit, 10th uh, group, for Sergeant Major's example, and he's there until a few months ago when he came and worked with me. Uh, that is very hard on your family. Um, so there are definitely concerns there for our leadership, and they've identified them um, over the past couple of years, and we're definitely working to make sure uh, our, our soldiers are treated better um, in the way they should be treated. Not that we've mistreated them in the past, but we want to make sure that they're afforded the same opportunities as every other soldier with time at home. Um, that deals with dwell, which I don't really want to get into, but uh, that's how we're trying to address it. I'll hand it over to Sergeant Major. Yeah. Um, so for all of you, I've never met a commander who wasn't presented an opportunity or a mission that they didn't fall in love with immediately. Uh, you know, for, for these guys, their team leader time generally was about two years. For the NCO, depending upon how long they serve, that team time can be 10 years, it can be 15 years. And that team leader comes in and they want to just sprint for that two years because they know once that two years is up, you know, their days of being out with the guys and, and doing the deed are pretty much gone. They're going to they're going to sit through a lot of staff time. They'll come back and get some command for, you know, 18, 24 months. But for the NCOs, we are grinding and, you know, sprinting two, four, six, eight, ten 10 years. Um, so it's important to remember that you know, we have to be able to say no occasionally. And I think we as a as an or, as a special operations community are identifying that we need to do a better job of ruthlessly prioritizing where we are used. Um, when you look globally right now, yes, we are taking the fight in a lot of places that maybe conventional forces are not, and that has had a little bit of its toll. And we have to kind of sometimes humble ourselves and realize, again, we aren't the solution to every single conflict. Um, so, you know, Major Goldtree was addressing it. One of the things we're definitely working on right now is validating that the mission set presented specifically requires a special operations focus and, and force, and what is the right force package for that. Um, we're, we're working on a culture that guys understand. It's okay to say, hey, I, I need to take a break for a second. It's okay, you know, I have some demons. I've seen some things, I've done some things. You know, I, Dave Engel, have gone and sought mental health treatment. 
we have to exist in a culture where it's okay to say that because you know there are things you just don't unsee but you do live with them there are scars that you carry with you but you know we have to if you aren't presented that opportunity to take that knee it, it's going to boil over and you unfortunately read about it in the news almost daily now uh, with with some of the other issues we have as an entire joint force suicide being a big one um, you know we have to we have to be there and I think part of that also relies on the teamwork within an organization where I don't think we, we build as cohesive of a team sometimes as we think we do because we're really good at going out and doing our job but we're building concrete without rebar that rebar needs to be also asking those personal questions you know amongst each other How, how's your family life hey man are you sleeping okay are you drinking too much you know what are you doing in your free time and sometimes people think that's a taboo subject and they don't want to touch it but those are those subjects that lead to a lot of the problems that we have and we have to be honest with ourselves and each other and ask those questions so that's something we as a community we're trying to to message hard um, and look at and really in, encourage those opportunities specifically for you know whether it's spiritual help mental health um, getting getting downtime and just it's, it's okay to take a knee you might miss that mission but that mission is still going to go on in your career isn't going to be impacted because you know you took six months to go take care of your life so so I'll, <clears throat> I'll give an answer uh, for those of you that I'm sure are taking notes for a paper or, or your capstone or whatnot um, my, my friends here on the stage gave you a perspective that's internal to SF. So for those of you in, in strategic studies classes and special operations classes, uh, what I challenge you to do is to critically analyze the employment of SOF. So SART Major alluded to it a little bit in terms of the mission set, right force package, et cetera. Um, but what, when you see the news, when you see conflict communicated to you through social media, um, you know, pause and actually ask yourself, you know, is, is the easy button, which is soft, the right button? Um, because there's certainly that, uh, that mentality out there. Uh, I'm sure many of you share that, otherwise there wouldn't be this romanticized ideal of what, what soft is. Um, but I think to, to make it even more applicable for where you're at right now in, in college, um, go through history uh, and critically analyze, you know, create case studies for yourself. Now, I'm not saying write a paper on it, um, but you know, when, when you're out at a bar, think through you know, event X. Hey, yeah, it's cool that the SEALs did that or the SF did that or whoever did that. Um, but did, did they need to do that? Uh, so, that? so the question I'll leave you with is just because you can do it doesn't mean you need to do it. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, my name is Elijah Payne from the United States Military Academy. Beat Navy. Uh, Sergeant Major, my question is uh, more directed towards you. Uh, what are the differences uh, between the roles and responsibilities of an NCO in the SF community uh, compared to the conventional army? I don't, I don't think there's any distinct difference um, between conventional NCO responsibilities and soft responsibilities. I think it's the, we are, we are supposed to be the subject matter experts. We are supposed to be what right looks like. Um, we're supposed to be the one that, that holds the standard and, and is the example of what right looks like. I think specific to our relationship with our officers, is it's challenging in that first you know couple weeks couple months uh, you know in the infantry I'd you know I'd already been to ranger school I'd already done certain things and you have a brand new second lieutenant show up who maybe has gone to ranger school maybe hasn't but we're in the infantry and now this platoon leader is supposed to be you know directing our platoon what to do but it maybe doesn't have the same tactical experience I do um, moving on to special forces you know, six or seven years of team time and a, a captain shows up and he's day one on the team, but he's the team commander. I think there, there, comes, there needs to be some honest conversations um, between this, those senior NCOs on that, in that unit and the officer uh, outlining that, yes, you're the detachment commander, but it's okay to, you know, 
admit that maybe you don't always know what's going on, but you know how to ask the right questions. Um, I think all of us up here, we aren't subject matter experts on everything that we do, but we work with a lot of great people who help guide us in the right direction. And sometimes we have to make an on-the-spot call, but rarely are we making that call without advising people close to us. So I think that's, you know, the role of the NCO, conventional or soft, we really have to be a, a solid sounding board to, to our officers who are making the decision because they need to be the face of our organization. They are the one that the buck stops with. Every good and or bad thing that happens, you know, we always say according to doctrine, role falls on that, the, the commander of that force. But you as the NCO, you really shape the culture of that force. Um, and it's our job to, to message to the force what that culture needs to be to support our commander's vision, his intent, his priorities. Um, so, but I don't, I don't think between soft and conventional there should be any difference. It's, it's just different specialties that we've devoted our career to. Thank you. Thank you. I want to reiterate what uh, Sergeant Major Angler just said. I mentioned to you the advice my dad gave me. He was an enlisted man in the Navy in World War II. When he said, when I thought I was, you know, hot stuff when I graduated the academy, he said, you're not. You're going to your first duty station. Go up to the NCO, go to the senior chief, and tell him you don't know anything, and have him guide you. Ask for his guidance and his knowledge, and it worked out great. And I, th I think that is the thing that we, I was talking about this morning, and I'd encourage all of you to make a big note of that, because that, that is so important. You know, you graduate, you're on top of the world, but when you get to your first station, you're in charge, but you need the NCOs to help. And sir, if I can just caveat yeah. one thing, just one lesson learned that I've seen. Don't be the officer that shows up and thinks that the way to build that rapport with the NCOs and the guys and gals in your, on your team is to start socializing and hanging out with them and you know going out to the bar and drinking with them um, because that's not how you earn the respect. You earn the respect by showing up to PT and if you aren't the fastest, you become the fastest. If you aren't the strongest, you become the strongest. If there's work to be done, you're there doing the work. Um, that's how you earn their respect. We, you know, my experience has been that the officers who try to just be one of the guys, it doesn't work out. That you don't, you don't actually have their respect because you become one of the guys. And that, that's not what the formation needs. Thank you. Uh, you're next, right? Okay. Uh, gentlemen, Cadet Kramer, West Point. Uh, given that SOF specializes in unconventional warfare, what role do you guys see SOF as playing in future U.S. conflicts as we potentially edge closer to conventional near-peer warfare with countries like China, Russia, uh, North Korea, and Iran? You want me to take this one? So, SOF's wheelhouse is in the competition phase of conflict. All right, so phase zero is very much conven conventional force, general purpose force, a big army, if you will. These are all horrible titles. But think rolling tanks and Bradleys across the plains to destroy this large force on the other side of some line. Um, we don't do well in that formation because we are small um, and ill-equipped to face what's on the other side of that line. Uh, left of that, phase zero, phase one, whatever you want to call it, in the competition phase, which is really where we're at right now, um, and that's why they keep having us go constantly. Uh, that's where we succeed. Uh, that's, that's our wheelhouse. That's where we're good at building those interpersonal relationships, uh, getting to know the locals, <coughs> leveraging their capabilities, their knowledge to influence uh, our adversaries, if you will. Uh, I'll hit, uh, just to caveat or kind of climb on what, what Brennan's saying, I'll geek out a little here. Um, so we're, we're spending a lot of time in the Pentagon looking at this at a very senior level. How are we doing uh, unconventional warfare, or regular warfare, really, um, and you know, unconventional warfare being underneath that? For soft specifically, you would probably look at it in two different ways. So there's a competition that Brennan's talking about. That is the endless game. That will never cease. We will always have a role uh, to compete, right? To create dilemmas for competitors in, in, in China, Russia, uh, Iran, Korea, we will always have a role there. But there's another part of the military, which we also play a role in, but it's, it's for the campaign plans. How are we setting up conditions 
which he's talking about, and the phases there, phase zero, left of beginning, so that when it turns into a great big fight, uh, a conventional fight, and now there's ships and airplanes in the air, and we're coming across terrain, what have we done to set conditions? So we're, we're kind of, we have two roles, and we have to understand that there's, there's this constant campaign of competition and shaping the environment so that we don't get to a, a big fight, but there's also, we need to be prepared for that big fight. And SOF actually does have a pretty, pretty good role in, in both of those lenses, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question, James? Yes, sir. I'll just, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention, there's a whole dynamic of, of SOF that is not Green Berets, not just in the Army, but in the Joint Force also. So here in the Army, you know, we have civil affairs and uh, PSYOP forces that are, are also vital in that you know, left of bang scenario, helping set those conditions. Um, you know, you can look across history, PSYOP has been going on since day one, you know. Um, go back to the Garden of Eden, you know, the snake and the apple. There was some, there was some PSYOP going on right there. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and think about, you know, we've had some World War II folks here the last two days. You know, there was some incredible PSYOP going on, you know, all across Europe and the Pacific there and how influential that can be. We don't necessarily need to defeat a force physically. If you take their will to fight away, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty spectacular too because it leaves a lot of other things intact that don't require cleanup later. So. so I think talking within, so going from the competition phase into the conflict phase, a lot of what they mention in terms of capabilities, I mean you can apply uh, also in the conflict phase but the key distinction in terms of that mind sh mindset shift uh, is that conventional forces will be the main effort and soft will be in support. Um, so when I mean, most of you in, in the audience are familiar with the tactical, tactical fight, so if you extrapolate that um, at the strategic level, when there needs to be a distraction or a shaping effort, uh, you know, maybe you have some marine raiders you know, with a FID force or uh, some SF guys with uh, an irregular force, all, all trying to set the conditions, like Ray said, so that it's easier for the tanks to roll through, the infantry to roll through, you know, FA to, to rain fire and steel um, w without, you know, as much risk um, had we not set the conditions. Nick. Good, good afternoon, gentlemen. Cadet Cersei, um, Air Force ROTC at Miami University. So I was told that if you tell the Army to secure a building, they'll establish 360 security, whereas in the Air Force, we'll put it down a down payment. So you guys, <laughs> obviously, the branches have very different roles and <clears throat> very different AORs across um, whatever theater we're fighting in. How do you all suggest that, or do you have any advice for all of us that may be going soft or non-soft to bridge those gaps between our sister services because a lot of our language, a lot of our acronyms, um, and even just the way we operate is just so different? Man, don't be weird. That's rule number one. <laughs> like, just, just be a good person uh, and, and acknowledge that there are differences and talk to them. Uh, which I find absolutely fascinating and amusing to me on a selfish level um, because I enjoyed watching you guys last night interact but not interact um, and I'm sure it'll be the same tonight at the ambassador's residence uh, and hopefully you've kind of broken down uh, those walls and you've developed some legitimate relationships so that um, you know you can carry it beyond tomorrow night's gala um, I actually got a note from the group of cadets I took here last year uh, two, two guys that branched infantry, um, they're in infantry in the eye bullock right now, uh, and they sent me a picture of two other cadets that were at this event uh, as they're sucking in the field, um, you know, training, but, you know, they, they had built that initial relationship. They kept in touch because uh, they, you know, those two seniors knew they were going to branch infantry or wanted to branch infantry. Um, Taking that, but crossing the service divide uh, and the interagency divide is, I think, how you do it. Just don't be weird. <laughs> I mean, that, that works, right? Don't yeah. be weird. Don't, don't be so weird. So I, 
Yes. Um, <laughs> I would remind everyone here that it's one team, one fight. It's not, I mean, short of football, right? Navy, <laughs> Army, all that. I'm a California guy, so I don't get all that. Um, ROTC. But, I mean, Navy, you do your ship thing. You float around in the Pacific. That's good stuff. <laughs> Air Force, you fly over me and make sure I'm safe. You drop bombs for me. Uh, Army guys, you're on the ground securing the terrain. Um, but it's one team and one fight. And the day you forget that, it's the day you lose, I think. Because the enemy has that down pretty well. Um, we need to make sure we, we up our game uh, as a joint force. And I don't work in the joint realm. I'm an Army guy right now. But uh, you definitely, in the Pentagon at least, and Ray can correct me if I'm wrong, we don't really see uh, service as much as we see the job and getting that job done. That's where I'd leave it. Yeah, I think the hardest part is figuring out the ranks. The rest of it's easy. I mean, <laughs> the end, at, at the end of the day, like, we're all human beings. Um, you know, we wear this uniform, we wear this rank, uh, but, you know, that this is Brendan. I'm Ray. Uh, we've known each other for years. Um, understand your purpose. You guys have a shared purpose. If you both understand that that's your shared purpose and that's your end state, um, that's all you need. Whether they outrank you or not, um, you guys are all there for a shared purpose. Um, and I think it's just establish a good relationship. It doesn't matter if you don't speak the same language, you'll figure it out. You'll stumble through it together. Um, yeah. I would say, I mean, the, the new buzzword right now is multi-domain operations. That's the future of warfare that we're looking at yeah. for the Army, you know, that we put 2028 on a, as a mark on the wall. Um, multi-domain operations cannot be successful without a joint effort. Um, I think for most of you guys in your future careers as officers, there's a lot of templated time built in where you're going to have assignments that, it, that require you to, involve, to communicate and interact with your joint partners. Um, for NCOs, one of the big things we've done in the special operations community is start to realize in our professional military education, we need to bring a joint aspect to that. Um, because for me to be an advisor to my commander, if I don't understand the relationships and the lingo and you know, do the best I can to figure out what rank somebody is when they walk up to me, I can't be a very successful advisor. So for the NCOs and the enlisted, we've been trying to increase those touch points. You're seeing a, we're, we're seeing an increase in the joint involvement in, multi, in the big exercises we conduct every year, which is really important. Um, I even think in, in some cases some of the, the BRACs and the realignments have, have mm -hmm. done things where it's no longer just an Army base. We now have joint base Lewis McCord. We now have joint base, et cetera. So there's things that we're doing to kind of break those cliches or those clicks that are, that are helpful. But, you know, I think everybody here has said it, it's keep an eye on the prize and realizing that, you know, being the guys down on the ground, we still rely heavily on everybody else that's there. You know, the, an ISR platform can be from almost any service. Um, you know, and somebody dropping equipment to us can be from almost any service. Somebody feeding us intelligence can be from any service. Mm -hmm. um, so it really doesn't matter what uniform you're wearing, just, you know, we're all Americans and, you know, let's get after it. Jimin? Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Chris Brakey. I'm a midshipman from the Naval Academy. Uh, beat Army. <laughs> Just kidding. Go Navy. Beat Army. <laughs> Sergeant Major, my question is for you. Um, you mentioned sort of the increasing prevalence in NCOs getting their master's degrees. Uh, my question is that do you see this as strictly a positive thing, or do you think this could become something that's like an unnecessary obstacle for people otherwise qualified for promotion? So I think it's incredibly important. Um, you know, my personal opinions on education are, are education should be a priority in everybody's life. Um, you know, I think education can help solve a lot of the problems we have worldwide. Um, and I think there's a lot of statistical research to back that up. Um, I, I think it's all, it is paramount for our job. I don't know that it requires a piece of paper. Um, you know, my bachelor's degree is in history to minor in government. My master's degree is in international relations. So I was fortunate enough that I started my bachelor's degree and it took me 10 years to get because I did it all while on active duty, all while, you know, doing different jobs. Same thing with my master's degree. It took me five years to get my master's degree. The benefit I had is I had already established myself in my career and kind of knew what I was doing. So I paired up an education with that. For those of you that are in school right now, you may not know what branch you're going to get and you find yourself, you know, studying one thing and then employing a completely different thing. 
my advice to a lot of young kids these days is, hey, a, a college degree is just a piece of paper that says you committed yourself to something for four years. So I don't think it's really important so much what your degree is in. It's, it's the lessons you learn while going to school, the ability to study, the ability to research, the ability to objectively opinion, like objectively find an opinion and, and defend that opinion on something. I think those are valuable things because communication is, is what prevents conflict. And if we can't communicate effectively, we're going to be prone to more conflict. So the, the, the requirement for it to be included in our promotion, there is a lot of debate amongst my peers on whether that should apply because was it a burden on my family that for almost 15 years I was, you know, taking classes at the end of each day and, you know, I'd come home, eat dinner, and then just do schoolwork, and on the weekends I'm doing schoolwork? Yeah, it was a pretty significant burden. And so my counterpart should probably not be penalized because they chose, you know, family time instead of that. But I do think it, it provides me with a skill set that maybe they don't have, and there is some value in that. So it's kind of a slippery slope. Um, that's why I said it's an unwritten rule. The way it's kind of written for us right now, specifically in our career field, is you, you're still qualified for promotion whether you have a degree or not. They just consider it a little bit of a bonus if you have that degree. Um, you know, the numbers are starting to trend a little bit towards a degree being a lot more important uh, for your promotion and your success. So. Any, no one else? Cadet? Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Cadet Willette. I am in Air Force ROTC at Bowling Green State University. Uh, I am currently in my last year of law school and with aspirations of being a JAG officer. And um, in my past experience, I've had a lot of conversations with JAG officers, and they always tell me that security forces are the ones that typically get the most discrepancies or court martials. And I was wondering if Abel, uh, could any of you give us like a brief story on maybe any of your um, military counterparts getting um, <laughs> disciplined? Never happened. Never happened. <laughs> so the, the first thing, I'll, I'll jump on this grenade <laughs> yeah, real quick. Exactly. <laughs> so glad Sergeant Major's here. That's right, we got four minutes left. Yeah. Um, you know, the UCMJ exists for a reason. I, I think <clears throat> co commanders and senior enlisted can can use discretion with their experience and wisdom to know how to apply the UCMJ appropriately. Not every case requires the book being thrown at you, but it starts well before UCMJ. Um, it starts with, I, I'm an NCO. I can tell you that it takes one hand to count how many officers have given me initial counseling when I showed up day one on the job, and I'm 20 plus years into my career. That's a problem because we aren't doing that hard work up front that, that sometimes prevents our need for JAG and UCMJ and court marshals and all that get coming into play. Um, you know, it goes back to taking care of one another and being, a t being on a team, but it's okay to put something on paper. It you know, th there's good and there's bad paperwork, but if you don't have the paperwork to support that you've been trying to you know, encourage and modify bad behavior or character, then you really aren't doing your job as a leader. You can talk to me all you want, but until you put it on paper, it doesn't matter because it doesn't count. Um, I'm not going to get into any, any of the misconduct stuff because, uh, you know, it, it's, I, I think it's, it's, it, it happens, it, it exists, and, and we address it, but I don't think there's value in, in airing it, so. I'll, I'll, I won't get into straight up story time, but I'll, I'll get to a point here. So day one. Second Lieutenant Ramos just reported to uh, my brigade commander and he sent me to a battalion and I reported to my battalion. My Sergeant Major sent me down and said, hey, uh, you're going to go to Alpha Company, 1st Platoon. And I walked into the barracks and I watched a, a soldier in handcuffs um, getting escorted out. Uh, and I was like, what, where's this guy coming from? He said, well, that's from your platoon. Um, it's going to happen. Um, and it's not to air dirty laundry, but you guys will see it. Um, and the JAG has got a huge role in that. Um, but that platoon sergeant, that team sergeant, those are the first two people you want to talk to. Um, <clears throat> and you're, maybe your company commander and first sergeant, uh, or the equivalent in your service to be like, hey, how, how do we handle 
this situation when it comes to, to legal policies and UCMJ. Um, it will happen, and I, I would just advise, be prepared for it. Um, it's not the end of the world. There are people there, like the JAG, that can help you through the process. Um, and from there, just kind of learn your lessons. Lean on the, the junior leaders around you that have already kind of been around it. Um, learn how the process works. Um, and, and take the time to, to try and avoid that with your young soldiers, airmen, marines, sailors, um, because it's going to be a challenge. Um, but you got to set the environment up so that, you know, best you can when it doesn't happen. I will just throw out real quick, you know, your role is going to be vital to everybody saying. else out here. Yep. Um, the, the commander and I weekly would go and sit down with the JAG just to either talk about cases, um, you know, and some of them were significant <coughs> cases. Some of them were just, you know, we're, we were OCONUS and, you, you know, the MPs just, you know, said you were legally parked and they're investigating you now. Do we have to flag that person? Do we not? So some of them can be very minute, some of them can be very significant, but making sure that we aren't fouling up an investigation because we say something we aren't supposed to say, even if it is with the best of intentions, but talking to that JAG, it became a battle in the <coughs> event. Um, and, I, and it also helps you inform your soldiers, your sailors, your airmen, your Marines. Um, so but you do play a vital role as an advisor to everybody else here in the room. Absolutely. So I, I guess I would say there's, uh, my, grand, my grandmother would say there's, you know, nobody's perfect except Jesus. She, <laughs> so every, the rest of us are pretty fallible. Um, you know, we can all mess up in some way, shape, or form. But I'd, I'd like to think the JAG isn't just there to uh, punish people. Uh, we use our JAG in SOF uh, to make sure operations happen, to find those permissions uh, in, the, in, in the paperwork, those authorities that give us the ability to go outside the door and do the job we need to do to, to, to keep America safe, right? To keep the fight, not at CONUS, but across the sea. Um, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of people just think the JAG is there to punish soldiers, so they steer away from them, but I found my JAGs to be invaluable to make sure I can get out the door and do the job that I'm supposed to be able to do. So I'll share a story, because I know that's what you want. Um, <laughs> But I'll also share the story from the conventional army, so it's not attributable to us as soft, since this is live streaming. Um, I will very quickly, though, echo what Brennan just said. Uh, the phrase I'd like you to remember is, help us get to yes. Um, many JAGs are seen as the no guy. No, sir, you can't do that. No, sir, it's not allowed. No, it's illegal. I'm tracking all that, man. Help me find a way to make it legal so that we can execute this mission that didn't come from me or from you, it came from higher. Uh, so the story I'll share, uh, really, it ends with the person in jail um, that I sent to jail um, because he had missed movement uh, and the movement was a deployment to Iraq. Uh, he was a 25 series, so he was a commo specialist. Our battalion was short, meaning I think we had a deficit of two uh, commo specialists. This is while we were stationed in Germany um, he missed the first deployment. We made him AWOL because we kind of had indicators that he did not want to deploy. Um, he came back about two months later. He was already off my books, but I had to reconstitute him via paperwork. Then he went AWOL again because I was going to send him down to Iraq to join the battalion. Uh, and then, long story, very short, uh, I got a phone call from German Polizei uh, because he had bought himself a plane ticket because he went AWOL in the States, came back to Germany uh, while he was drunk, stole a police vehicle, and then crashed it into another police vehicle. Um, so he was in custody. I had enough paperwork. And at the advice of my JAG, uh, you know, even though we were hurting on his very critical skill down in, uh, in Sadr City, of all places, um, he recommended we, we throw the book at him. Um, so that was a very long and arduous uh, trial process. Um, uh, made more personal because he was from the same area that I grew up. Um, and he had his mom come and try to plead, plead his case. Uh, but, but I testified that he went AWOL twice. It was a critical skill that was mission essential, essentially. Mission essential down in Sadr City. Uh, and at the time, you know, our, our battalion was suffering uh, 
at least one casualty a month, if not two. Um, and the, the judge said, you know, he found him guilty and uh, basically sent him to jail. Not, not confinement, but like actual real jail uh, back in the States. Because confinement, I know, is what you're familiar with likely. This was, he was in confinement under custody, uh, but I separated him and he went to jail. He served in a penitentiary. He's, I think he, was, he finally was released. But, so that's my story. Not soft related. Thank you, gentlemen. And I, I was just going to, one final note on that, just if I can advise those of you in the room here. Um, you know, he brought up the idea that it's personal, maybe because he's from a hometown, but it's also personal for you as the one who's going to execute the UCMJ because you know this soldier. And that's a different aspect that the civilian courts don't understand. If that individual had been a civilian and done those things, they still would have gone to court, but they'd been prosecuted and defended by somebody who didn't have, have any idea who they were, you know, adjudicated by a judge who had no idea who they were. So it's really easy in that position for all those bodies not to have that personal involvement. It probably doesn't cloud their judgment. Um, you know, the UCMJ is a very effective tool, but the one thing that it, it can't account for is the human dimension that you'll know this soldier. You might know their, or sailor, marine, you know, airmen, you might know their family, you might know their kids, but you know what, you need to ask yourself, what would happen if they did that in the civilian world? Because there, there is a time for you to use your judgment on whether or not to throw the book at them, but what message does that send to the rest of the folks in your formation? Um, standards are standards and they, they need to be there. Um, so prepare yourself mentally for that because you do have to make that personal call that might change that person's life. Kicking somebody out of the military can be life-changing, but sometimes it's also the wake-up call they need to get their stuff together. Thank you. Thank you all. Um